And uh, we started the other day with the uh, the worksheet from or one of the worksheets in the app. We do have the world's only forgiveness app, and if you want to download it and use it, you know, it's the only app in the world that's designed for you to be able to go through step by step with guidance and instruction how to do the forgiveness process, how to walk through the original Aramaic idea of forgiveness. And so uh, there are two different versions of the worksheet, and so we're now in the shorter version the abbreviated version of the worksheet, and we've covered up to step three, or pardon me, up to step two. We're now starting on step three. And step three affirms once again, if you remember in step one, the first thing we invite you to do is acknowledge who you are. So in step 1A, I love who am. So you're recognizing yourself as the active presence of love. And, you know, probably one of the greatest mistakes that leads people to pain, to trauma, and to suffering is they identify themselves with what is false and not with what is true. So in step three, we invite you once again to affirm who you are. So step three, I love, want. Now, the, we've, we've laid out in the first two steps the circumstances which our mind tells us are the cause of our upset. And remember that when we put the state of our mind on our circumstances, we're now stuck in a lie. It's called denial. When I think or speak as though something inside of me, something is happening outside of me, then I'm living in denial. And in order to be consistent, when I enter into denial, my mind cuts me off from the real cause of my turmoil, pain, suffering, or upset, and connects me to a lie. It's called perception. And perception is a construct of the mind. And our perceptions are constructed out of whatever is called into activity at any given moment in the mind. And when I reflect on the brilliance of the first century Aramaic forgiveness process. And I don't care where you look in the world. You're not going to find anything like this unless it went back to that first century Aramaic. I mean, I've just seen nothing that even comes close. But, well, let's, let's quote from some Harvard research first. That's one of the core pieces here. What they tell us in this Harvard research is that in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells are firing, there are 10,000 measurable units of electrical activity in the brain, that the max amount of data that goes into our perceptual construct in that time frame, which is about a 25th of a second, is nine bits. Now, obviously, something has to determine which nine bits of data are going to be used to build our perception. There's a whole lot more information going on in there, but what is it that shows up as our perception? What shows up is what's recruited into activity. Now, imagine that you want to build a pro football team. What are you going to do? You're going to go out and get yourself a recruiter. And the recruiter is going to go around to all of the schools, the high schools, look at football teams, and is going to call into activity the best players he can find, the ones who are going to serve his purpose best. You know, the ones who don't fit the team motto, the team vision, the, the team capability, don't get called into action by the recruiter. Well, that's a perfect analogy for goals. The recruiter that causes certain information within the mind and within genes to come into activity to form this world that we perception is literally our goals. Now, when I reflect on that, and after 50 years of working in this arena, when I reflect on that, the brilliance and the genius of this man, Yeshua, to understand that what 
not causes our perception. What causes our perception is the data held in mind. But what's recruited into formulating our perception is key. And of course, if you know what the recruiter is, and you remove the recruiter, what's been called into activity, obviously, isn't going to function. It's, it's going to have to collapse. Now, we've been taught by the world that we have this pair of windows called eyes, and we look out through these windows on the world and we see what's happening. That is one of the most ludicrous, foolish, ridiculous ideas that has ever existed, and yet you talk to virtually every intellectual in the world, every wise man, every stupid man, they're all going to tell you, yeah, I saw that happen. I'm going to offer an alternative thought. You have never seen anything happen in your life, and you never will. Oh, wait a minute, Michael. I opened my eyes, and there was the picture. Have you ever thought to question that picture? You know, when you get down to the physics of it, and that's my background is physics, the eye is a receiver for light energy. Light energy comes into the eye, and according to the information carried on that light energy and the law of resonance, whatever's in resonance in the mind with that light energy, that light information coming into the eye, is called into activity. It, it, it responds to resonance. So the eye is a one-way valve. You can no more look out through your eyes than you could pull the wires off the back of a TV and look up through those wires and see out through the antenna. I mean, it's just silly, just plain silly when you really start to think about it, investigate it. Perception is a construct of the mind internally generated. Now, we could go to lots of you know, sources of information to verify this, the latest in uh, neurotechnology and such. One of the pieces of information we came across a while back, I don't know, four or five years ago. You know, we've been teaching this for decades. But four or five years ago, we came across a book written by the CIA. I see it's still on the website. And you can go to CIA.gov or you can actually go to whyagain.org and we've got a link to it. And I, I have no idea how many millions of dollars the government spent to write this book on human intelligence. And there's a chapter in the book entitled Perception. If you go to the core research on perception, and basically what the CIA was working to do was improve the intelligence gathering services that they, they utilize. Here's what they said, quote, the mind does not perceive reality, the mind generates reality. Each person lives in their own reality. Whoa. So what happens? Light energy comes into the eye. Information fires in brain cells. In this one piece of research, we say, we see that there are 10,000 brain cells firing, but only nine bits recruited by our goals formulates this world that we see. And what happens is unknowingly, you know, we're designed to be in relationship with the actuality of this energy field called life, but we substitute this construct called perception and we put it in front of that and think that we're actually looking at the world and what we're really looking at are constructs of our own mind. As the CI said, the mind does not record reality, the mind generates reality. And what causes the mind to use this data compared to that? What recruits the goal into activity? Or pardon me, what recruits the data into activity? It's your goals. Construct our offering is. You know, one of the questions we'll ask oftentimes in the why is this happening to me again workshop is, how many have ever done something you regret? Of course, everybody kind of laughs and puts their hand up. Say, so what we're going to do is we're going to invite you to think about a time, any time in your life, where you've done something that you regret. Okay? Now, what were you feeling when you did that behavior which you now regret? And you know what the answer is 100% of the time? 
the answer is always some form of hostility or fear. Rage, guilt, grief, whatever. Once in a while, somebody will say love, but when we investigate that, what they really mean is attachment or greed or possession. They really don't mean love. Oh, I love them, and that's why I did the bizarre thing they wanted me to do that I now regret. Well, it wasn't love. It was fear of them, the desire to whatever it was. It wasn't human life that made you do that. So our offering is that when your perceptual construct is based on any form of hostility or fear, and this is a huge piece of learning to get, whenever that happens, your mind is lying to you. Hostility and fear indicate that the mind is using corrupt data. And your corrupt data mind is a lie. And what you want to do Before you do anything, is you want to collapse the lie. How do you collapse it? You cancel the goal. You get rid of the recruiter. (laughs) The goal that pulls this particular set of hostility and fear-based data into activity to formulate this perceptual construct, when removed, causes that perceptual construct to collapse. Now the lie collapsed in on itself gives you direct access to what underlies the lie. Otherwise, you know, people say, you made me mad, you made me sad. And they never stop to think that while I'm blaming them, I'm the one who's feeling what I'm feeling. And we've got a test in this work for determining whether or not what you're feeling is yours or not. How do you know if what you're feeling is yours or not? Now, this is a complex one. How do you know? You're feeling it. If you're feeling it, you know that it's yours. Now, if you put it into your brain's image of somebody else, you can pretend it's about them, but the truth is it's your physiology that this energy is moving in. It's you that's feeling it, and if it's based on us, it your fear. Your mind is a liar. There is no truth in it. So what you want to do is to collapse its activity. And so the first step to doing that is to recognize precisely what the recruiter is, that is, what the goal is. So step number three, I affirm who I am again. And in 1B, we named whoever the object of attention was about. So if I say, you know, Bill made me angry. Bill is my object of attention, B1B. So 1A, I'm acknowledging who I am as love. And 1B, I'm acknowledging who the object of attention is that my mind is blaming my state on. So I love, want 1B2. And here you want to state in positive words what the recruiter is for this pained perception. What's your goal for number 1B? So think about the ideal outcome for this situation. What is it you want? Now, this is a really important step because if you don't identify your goal correctly and you do what the Aramaic forgiveness process uh, says you must do and that is cancel it, the perceptual construct isn't going to fully collapse. So the more exact and specific the actual operating goal in your mind is, the faster that construct is going to collapse in you and the deeper your access is going to be to the underlying pain. And when you bring active present love forward and you bring underlying pain forward, when the two meet, the pain begins to dissolve. And that's where the forgiveness process happens. So what's the goal that I hold for this object of attention? And then... So you've identified the goal, and then there's actually a little trick that's added here so that I can, and then you'll find that there's still another goal. So I want Bill to cooperate with me so that I can win. I want Bill to pay me what he owes me so that I can pay my bills. So 
there, there are actually oftentimes multiple goals operating in this step, and, and we thank Magda for bringing this particular idea into the worksheet. And thank you to everyone over the years. You know, if you go back to my book and, and look in the first few pages, I do an acknowledgement of some of the people who impacted this work over the decades of developing it before I wrote the book. I don't know how many names there are now, four or five hundred different people that I acknowledge there. And, you know, this has been a, a community corroborative effort, effort to bring this work of forgiveness forward. And I certainly thank and appreciate everyone, and in particular, for this idea. Maj, if you're listening, we cherish you and appreciate you. So what's the goal? I want Bill to pay me what he owes me so that I can pay my bills. So that's step three in the short form of the worksheet from the app, which you can find at in your app store if you type in the words Heartland Aramaic Forgiveness. And then number four, what I'm looking to do is to reconnect to the presence of love. So I choose to reconnect to my original being instead of my upset. If we've become identified with a, let's say, an, an hostile or fearful or victim identity in our minds, then we've identified with a falsehood. I want to change that identification and recognize that if, I, if I'm identifying with the weakness of some form of hostility or fear, I've lost my connection to my source, to my original being. So I choose to reconnect to my original being, love, instead of my upset. And you'll see a set of brackets there for the rose and the butterfly story. And the rose and the butterfly story is one that I love to tell at this stage of, uh, of doing the Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop because it just so powerfully illustrates this idea. So let's imagine we have a rose and a butterfly. We give them each an ego. They meet. They fall in love. They have this wonderful time together, this wonderful relationship and one day, the butterfly up and flies away. The rose, knowing that the love of the butterfly is the most important thing in its life, uproots itself to give chase. What's going to happen to the rose? It's going to die. Why does it die? Because it made something more important than being connected to its source. Yes, the relationship with the butterfly is important, but its connection to the earth and its source is more important. We're offering to you that what the world hasn't taught us is that your connection to your true being is more important than any goal you could think about achieving. If you're uproot and lose that you to, in pursuit of anything other than that, then, well, it, it's interesting, Course in Miracles labels those things that we chase as trifling treasures. And it suggests you put those trifling treasures away. And when you do, then perception, the recruited data, when you cancel the goal that recruited that data, collapses. And when it collapses, it collapses in on itself and gives you access to its root. You know, a good visual for that is to, you know, we watched back in 9-11, we watched these towers collapse into their own footprint. That's what happens to perception a free fall right into its own footprint, and now you have access to the underlying cause of the pain or trauma that you put into your brain's image of other people and think that they're the problem and they're the cause. And then there's a reminder, once again, to breathe. Because when we shut the breath down, we disconnect from source, and we inhibit the movement of truth within us. Number five, A, in order to collapse my false reality, be liberated from my hostility and fear, actual mind and the truth about me and my object of attention, I cancel. You see in Aramaic it says shebag. The, the word forgive in Aramaic is shebag or shabak, and it literally means to cancel. I cancel my goal for number one B, and you copy exactly from number three. And when you're doing the, the worksheet, 
in the app, the app populates it. So when you answer number three, that will automatically show up in number five. And so you're going to cancel the goal for number 1B. So if you were doing a written worksheet, you'd be copying it longhand. The app populates it automatically. And Jeannie, all those little things that you put in the app are awesome. So why am I canceling this goal? Am I canceling this goal because, you know, this person, well, the desire for this person to pay me what they owe me is a bad goal? No, that's a wonder. You know, somebody owes you something that's reasonable to say, I'd like you to pay me. You don't cancel it because there's anything wrong with that goal. Well, Michael, why would I cancel it? Because when you recognize that if you put a goal into your mind and it recruits hostility and fear from your, your past, then you'll end up living in a perceptual construct from the past and you'll live the lie. And people do that again and again and again. And you can, you know, if you go into the app, if you look, there's a link that says more. And if you click that, there are links. And one of the things you can do is you can download the book. Why is this happening to me again? Directly from the app. It's freebie. So in step five, I want to, I, I'm canceling the goal for one reason, one reason only. I'm in a hostility and fear-based fake reality, false reality. I want to be liberated from my hostility and fear and get back to the truth. So I cancel my goal for be able to pay me. Now, when you realize that underlying this nine, what we call the nine-bit mind, and some people say, well, the research says it's 11 bits. Well, so it's nine bits, 11 bits, it's 15 bits, it's 20 bits. We're not here to argue about, you know, the, the, something that will probably never be fully established. We just want to make the point that the conscious awareness in the mind is a small fraction of what's going on under the surface. In fact, like an iceberg, if you listen to some psychologists, they'll tell you that as much as 98% of your mind's activity is unconscious. And my offering is we're not designed to have an unconscious mind. That's, that's not how it's designed to work. The unconscious mind is an artificially created state that we're not designed to live in. And, you know, in the ancient teachings, when they said the veil of the temple must be rent in twain, they were not talking about a purple curtain in a church. The temple is your body-mind unit. The veil of the temple, as opposed to a purple curtain in a church, this body-mind unit is your temple, and the veil is the barrier between the subconscious, subconscious and the unconscious. The artificial barrier that we have built in order to to, to stay away from, in order to hide from ourselves what it is that we don't want to deal with. And so what we're doing is inviting that veil to open by using the breath and touching into the truth. And so once again, in step five, there's a reminder to breathe. Now, recognizing there's much more under the surface, if I have, you know, kind of metaphorical, but if I have a nine-bit mind and there are 10,000 bits of data moving under the surface, how do I ever become aware of that? How do I ever deal with that? Well, there's not enough space to deal with it. But what Yeshua taught 2,000 years ago is that there is a power in you that can deal with it. It came with the package. It was like a, you know, a package gift that you were given. In Aramaic, it was called Rukha de Kudja. Rukha de Kudja, Rukha, Rukha, it's actually, you know, I don't say it quite properly. It's one of those guttural words you, know, you, you say it and you spit all over people because it comes right from back deep in the throat. Rukha de Kudja, in Aramaic, is properly defined as a feminine elemental force in us that undoes the effects of ours and teaches us the truth. Now, I know that our male-oriented society and our male-oriented churches have made it a male thing. He, the Holy Spirit, are the words. That's the translation the Greeks gave it. got nothing to do with the disembodied spirit being, and it sure is not a he in Aramaic. In Aramaic, the word that describes this elemental force is gendered feminine. So a feminine elemental force in us and the two main things that that feminine elemental force will do 
if you wanted to. Now, you've got free will. It's never going to interfere. But if you want it to, if you invite it into activity, it will, one, undo the effects of your errors. It literally has the power to reach out through all of the creation and any particular issue that you're willing to work through energetically will be loosed in the world. It does, undoes the effects of errors. And two, if you're willing to listen and receptive, it will directly teach you the truth. Now, it's hard for it to directly teach you the truth. When your mind's trying to explain to you that this person is acting just like your mother did, just like your father did, they're doing it to you again, so you better get your defenses up and puke on them, because if you don't, they'll get you. You know, if your mind's doing all that garbage, really hard for this elemental force to come in and say, excuse me, you notice you've been through this 87 different times with 42 different people, and you're the only one that was there. This is about you, and here's what you need to heal, and I can help you with it. It's going to be hard to hear that if you're yelling and screaming and raging in your hostility or fear about how it's all everybody else's fault that this is happening to you again. You know, the point at which you go, I've been through this 87 different times with 42 different people, and I'm the only one that was here every time. Maybe this is about me is a really important point in your process. So once you recognize that, and when you look back through the generations, how much unconscious data is there? So in 5B... It's a space to invite that power into activity. Now, I choose, and you'll see that the definition is there as you look through the app at this particular worksheet in brackets in Aramaic, Ruka to Kutcha. I usually just shorten that to Ruka. I invite Ruka to incline me toward healing, to restore me to my original nature, love, Assist me in keeping love present and help me come into direct conscious relationship with and remove the dissociated projected parts of my carbon-based memory. So there's several requests that we suggest you make each time you do a worksheet. And you'll see that it shortens CBM, carbon-based memory shortened to CBM. What is CBM? Well, if you talk to a modern-day physicist and they check out, or a physiologist and check out your, your structure, they'll tell you the base element in your body is carbon. Carbon is an atom that is made up of six electrons, six protons, six neutrons. Maybe when they said the anti-love, the anti-Christ was, had a number and that was 666, maybe they knew what they were talking about. So, you know, you look at any particular person in any particular situation of conflict, you know, you got a dozen people standing around and, and let's say somebody comes into the room and does some horrible thing. One person runs off in rage, another one runs off in fear, another one sits there crying, another one is immobilized in fear. If, if the action that person took were the cause, it would be the same effect in everybody. Obviously, each person has in them a past that formulates the rules for them of behavior and perception. And that past tends to work against living as the truth of who we are. If, if living in the mind of love, if, if we look at the religious language, and if we go back to the Aramaic, there's nothing religious about it. We talk about the mind of Christ. And the word Christ is not a religious term. It's not the name of a man. It's actually the name of an office. You know, very much like, you know, if, if I ran for mayor tomorrow and I won, you would call me Mayor Rice. You wouldn't call me, you know, and you wouldn't think that mayor was my name. You'd know that it was the name of an office that I hold. So this man, Yeshua, who became called the Christ, held an office. And the office was that of one who had awakened. By the way, a place you're invited into, the same as he was. It isn't an exclusive space. If you listen to him, now you listen to his followers, you get a different story. But everybody's invited to go there. So what I'm doing is I'm asking this elemental force for several things. 
I want to be, I want my natural inclination. If my natural inclination is to go to look at, you know, the dark side, the glass, glass is half empty, they're going to get me, you know, victimhood, I want to upgrade my mind. So in climbing toward healing, remind me and restore me to my original nature, which is love. Assist me in keeping love present. And help me to commit a direct conscious relationship with and remove the dissociated and projected parts of my mind. So these are the things we're asking for. And, you know, if you come up with another request, you're certainly welcome to fill it in. But they're the basic minimums that we suggest. So that's 5B. Then, in number six, and we're just asking for the truth of how do you feel. So number six, I now feel better, worse, and it could be either. We're, we're not going to suggest that every time you do a worksheet, you're going to go, hey, this it feels wonderful. Actually, if you collapse the surface mind's projections, you may find deeper parts of your mind that are hidden from you that don't feel very good. Remember, we were back in step two, I'm willing to go through the symptoms of healing. I'm willing to open and go into those hidden parts of myself and process them. And sometimes you're going to spend a significant amount of time in those parts of your mind. You know, if you've got decades and generations of rage and hate-filled rhetoric going on in your world and in your life and in your family system and in your culture, and you just take a look at the culture today, and everybody's got a fair share of it, or most people have got a fair share of it, don't expect that to be over the first second. It's a process. And you're going to spend time in contact with those hidden parts of your own mind willingness is the thing that will move us most quickly. When, people, when that starts to come up and people go, oh, well, I don't want to feel this, I don't want to feel that. You just listen to their voices. You can hear their whole energy field starting to shut down, the breath shutting down. That person's going to spend probably years and years and years in that trauma posture. The person who steps into willingness, this is what we'd like to call cosmic grease, will tend to move through those things much more quickly. That's why we've got a statement in there about willingness. So how do you feel? And when I look at the situation that I described up in number one, B and C, and again, the app will populate that for you. It'll put your answer in there. Take a look at it. And, and how does the situation look to you? And over the years of, you know, four decades, it's been five decades of developing this work, but it was about four decades ago that I started to work with the Aramaic. The most common response that I've gotten from people through the years is, I don't believe, I, I can't understand why I was so upset about that. You know, it's like no big deal. I mean, here's somebody who's maybe spent years in trauma, and they think it was about that something, but when they canceled the goal and they found the real root of what they were in trauma about, and they processed through the trauma, all of a sudden there's no trauma left. So they look at that situation, it's like, I don't even understand why I was ever upset about that. Well, here's the truth. You were never upset about it. Your mind lied to you and told you you were upset about that. You just had upset in your mind that it had been unresolved. And the idea of this work is to resolve and finish that upset, that disturbance. You're not designed to live out of that. So it takes time to process through it. And then, now that you've opened that space, what we're going to invite you to do is go back and look at the goal that you held in number three. You know, it was for Bill to have paid me. And then I want to look at time in my life where I violated that goal with myself or someone else. And oftentimes people go back and remember, let's see if that was the goal. They might go back to a time when they cheated somebody. And, you know, maybe felt guilty. Now, all of a sudden, somebody cheats them, and they want that person to feel guilty. They're just projecting their guilt. They're just trying to get somebody else to play it out so they don't have to deal with it. The idea of this work is to own it. And when you own something in the presence of love, you get to process through it. And remember, in this work, we define processing as the ability to keep love conscious, active, and present when something less than love comes up. So just make note of, and this sometimes can be a very insightful step. 
when did I violate that goal that I hold, held in number three for this other person? And just make note of it. And, you know, that might open another worksheet for you. And then number seven, in number 1B, so I'm, I'm going back and looking at who the object of attention was in this worksheet. And again, the, the uh, F will populate that for you. So if I'm working on Bill, Bill's name will appear in the blank in number one, in number seven. So Bill, I acknowledge us for creating truth, perfect love, and so, so what I'm looking to do at this point is to keep to move my relationship with Bill and my own mind to a place of truth and a place that out of the Aramaic was called perfect love. And you remember they said perfect love casts out fear. What does that mean? Well, without a big explanation, there are other shows where we spend a lot of time on this topic. In the frontal lobes of a brain, there's a filter. In the brain, there's a filter called Rachma. In the back of the brain, there's a filter called Kuba. When those two filters are active in the mind, as opposed to the hostility and fear filters, that mind was said to be in perfect love. And a mind that's connected in that way can't produce a hostility or fear-based reality. So perfect love casts out fear. Joining with whoever I'm doing this worksheet on, Bill, I acknowledge us for creating truth, perfect love. And then I want to step into... What's a loving goal that I'm willing to take action on in regard to whoever I'm doing this worksheet on? So my loving goal might be, so Bill, I, I can hear that you've had a rough time and you don't have money and you can't pay me, so I'm going to work toward treating you with compassion. Yeah, I still have need for my money and I still have upset about it, and maybe I'll do some more worksheets and clean some of that up, but I'm willing to hear that you've had a rough time this year and, and you're just not in a position to take care of it. So I'm, I commit to having compassion for you and understanding. And that would be the completion of this shorter form of the worksheet.